Vice President of the United States. I have just been looking over some of the sketches made in Vietnam for the motion picture that you're about to see. These are wonderfully strong pictures. They capture the spirit of the people of that country. Now, just take a look at this one. Throughout Vietnam, you see strong faces like this, determined and patient. The story, the hope, and the determination of these brave people of South Vietnam and what they're doing to build on their hopes has not been told as often as has the story of war in their ravaged land, but it's just as true. Here are some others. They are really building something over there. They are building the foundations of a society in which they and their children can live in peace and freedom. And they are doing this in the midst of an ugly war forced on them by aggressors who want to control them. They are doing it with their muscle and their hearts, but they are doing it at the ballot box too. In hundreds of hamlets across the land, they are demonstrating their faith, faith in themselves and in their future. They're also proving their faith in us because we have taken our stand beside them. No one who really knows what these determined people are doing can doubt the rightness of their cause, nor can they doubt the rightness of our help. For we are making possible the conditions under which they can build their nation. Their effort to build that nation is a story that needs to be told. It is a story of men who prize freedom and it is a story honoring men who put their lives on the line for freedom. The story of Vietnam today is the story of war and of the men of different nations who fight that war to end the enemy's aggression. It is the story of war's effect on the people who live in this troubled land. But the untold story of this historic moment in Vietnam is one of heroic adventure. It is a revolutionary undertaking by the people of the Republic of Vietnam to transform their national life and construct out of the chaotic legacy of the past a social order that will work for the betterment of all. story of a people building a nation for themselves and building it amid the holocaust of war. A generation ago, not many Americans could have said with certainty where or what Saigon was. Today, no city in the world more urgently commands our attention. It is the capital city of a nation at war. The strangest war in which Americans have ever been involved. It is also the capital of a nation in the throes of a social revolution. And America's participation in that revolution is just as urgent as its involvement in the war. Being the capital city, Saigon is the source of South Vietnam's revolutionary effort. But you have to come out here in the countryside to see what it's all about. The Defense Department has asked me to help bring you this story of Vietnam's attempt to build itself into a nation. And to do this, I've called on some expert help. This is Lieutenant Mark Nelson, U.S. Navy. He's commander of a division of the patrol craft which prevent infiltration of enemy troops and supplies along the coast. And this is 
Sergeant Shelley Blunt of the Air Force. Sergeant Ken Sanders with the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force at Da Nang. And Spec 5 Dale Kemry with the 25th Infantry Division. These fellows are stationed here, and they know the country, at least in the special way that American fighting men have come to know it. So from their own experiences and observations, they know the story, and together we're going to try to give you an informed picture of what it is that's going on over here. We're in the hamlet of Niton, about 15 miles north of Saigon. It's a peaceful-looking rural community, and life goes on here much as it has for hundreds of years in this part of the world. But there's an operation going on a mile or two from here, and the peace and quiet of this little village is shattered by the sounds of war. The drones of helicopters overhead, and every once in a while, this rumble of artillery. That's one thing you learn after you've been here in Vietnam for a while. The war is never very far away. These hamlets and villages are the real soul of the country. Four-fifths of the people of South Vietnam live in them. And it is here, in these dusty trails through the countryside, these thatched huts and farmland and jungle, that the thrust of South Vietnam's great social revolution is directed. In Vietnam, revolution is a double-edged word. The enemy uses it. It's, it's, it's what they call the aggressive war they're using against the people over here. That's the story. And there's nothing mysterious about the kind of revolution the enemy has in mind. It's the same thing we've seen in many parts of the world ever since the communist revolution 50 years ago. Murder, assassination, terror. And over here, they've killed over 20,000 civilian leaders. That is the story of the civilian population. It is public knowledge that these people in their fight for freedom have lost proportionately already more troops than we lost in the whole of World War II. And yet, in spite of this, there have always been men brave enough in this country to step forward and take the leadership from those who have been killed. And it's these same brave people who have had the will and the guts to conduct their own revolution, a real revolution for the betterment of their people. At the same time, they have been fighting a war for their very survival. What the government of Vietnam is launching is a national effort to eliminate and defeat a pattern of social misery which has plagued the people of Vietnam for generations. They intend to replace it with a society in which the needs of the people can be met. Now, they call it revolution, and it certainly is. And they call it nation building. And it's that, too. The people over here have never had very much. And they want their share. They want the things that are important to them. That is what they mean by revolution and what it's all about. They want a better life. They want social justice, but the guy in the rice paddy wouldn't call it that. As a matter of fact, he probably wouldn't know what those words mean. But it's the same thing. Now, he wants to be left alone. He's tired of being frightened, kicked around, and beaten up. He wants some personal dignity. And he certainly doesn't get very much of that over here. These people want education. It's the key to the future for them. And health is another big problem. Disease is a serious thing. And life expectancy is pretty low. Well, the war helps that along. It sure does. But some of these people never get to see a doctor. You ought to see the way they crowd around some of our medics. These people want dispensaries and clinics so that they can get taken care of and get their families taken care of so they can live a little longer. Social justice, if that's what you want to call it, or simply the desire not to be beaten up, education for the children, health facilities, the hunger for land and to make the land more bountiful. These are the wants of the people. They are the objectives of Vietnam's social revolution. Trouble is, the Viet Cong have told the people they'd give them the same thing. Yeah, and they shoot anybody that doesn't believe them. Well, but sometimes the people don't know who to believe. That's why the government has to make good on its promises right now. 
If they don't, the revolution is dead. But we can't wait on it. We've got to get this war won. If we don't, there won't be a nation to build. Yes, we in the South Vietnamese must win this war. The social revolution cannot be successful unless the people feel secure and safe from communist aggression. The enemy was proud of the technique he had developed for pursuing what he called his wars of national liberation. Who could stop him? Not the Americans, or so he thought. The leaders of the North Vietnamese military forces said that the organization, composition, and training of American forces were not fit to tackle a revolutionary war. I guess they forgot 1776. Anyway, we Americans who knew something about revolution developed a revolutionary answer in the field to these cutthroats and terrorists. The myth of Viet Cong invincibility is dead. The ground, sea, and air team in Vietnam has killed it. America decided a long time ago, in principle, to take its stand in Vietnam. It laid the foundations for that decision when it recognized that aggression against the weak could never be permitted to succeed if freedom was to survive. The fighting men in Vietnam are the inheritors of that decision, and now they are its agents. Accolades in war are easy to give, but there is a general agreement that never before in its history has America put into combat a force so composed of men ready for their job. They serve the cause of freedom well. They're fighting men and not philosophers, so they don't talk much about freedom, but they know their job and they know how it figures in Vietnam's effort to build a nation. We've got to get this war won. If we don't, there won't be any nation to build. The final outcome of the Vietnam story will not be determined in the cities or even in the places of open conflict with the enemy. But out here, in these small clusters of rice farmers and fishermen. That captain over there is Peter Dawkins. Just a few years ago, he was making All-American at West Point. But now he's up to his eyeballs in a really historic adventure. The effort of the Vietnamese government to create a nation where no real sense of nationhood has ever existed before. Well, with his help, I hope that we'll be able to show you what nation building means in thousands of hamlets across the country like this. Pete, you're on. Well, you know, this, uh, this nation building is an abstract term. And so is social revolution, which is the other term the Vietnamese use for what they're trying to do. But what these terms really boil down to, essentially, is an effort to bring a better way of life to the millions of Vietnamese that live in these villages and hamlets across the country. This is a staggering undertaking, but one of vital importance. The peasant of Vietnam is well overdue his claim to a better shake. The unusual thing is that the government is trying to give the peasant that better shake even while the war is going on. When you look at that fact closely, you discover something truly unique about this war. Improving the lives of these people is not just a humanitarian idea. It's a military necessity. And every American who comes over here to fight soon becomes aware of this. Tomorrow about midnight, you'll surround the village of Tan Phu Khan and completely seal it off. If you encounter any VC, you'll, in, you'll take your normal combat action. After you seal off this village, it's going to be a little different, however. At first light, we're going to take the government of Vietnam to Tan Phu Khan. There's going to be a large group of people going into this village that you've surrounded. And it's going to be their job 
to show them that the government of Vietnam is the best choice. And your job is just as important in that you've got to convince these people that you as soldiers are on their side. You're going to gain their confidence by working with them to build a little better life. Basic kindness and generosity are not unknown in the tradition of the American fighting man overseas, but no one ever expected that they would become military weapons as well. But that's the kind of a war this is. Non-military assistance is also a major part of America's contribution to the Vietnam struggle and has been from the beginning. My name is Mike Rolla. I'm with the United States Agency for International Development here in Vietnam. I've been here about three years now, working in the province of Ja Dinh. My work has involved almost everything that is non-military, from the building of schools, maternity dispensaries, roads and bridges. Basically what we've been trying to do though is work with the people and help them as much as they can to realize their aims and, and their wishes. Basically, what we're trying to do is help the government of Vietnam respond to these needs and these wishes, helping the government respond to the needs of the people. The U.S. is not alone either in the contributions it is making. This is one of a number of social centers used also as schools during the day, which the West Germans have set up in the crowded and poor districts of Saigon. An Iranian surgical team provides badly needed hospital services in one of the districts. Such activities document the very important fact that 39 nations of the free world today are helping, or have promised to help, the Republic of Vietnam in one way or another. All of this is enormously important and helpful to the common cause. But these activities can only be considered as the initial steps to help get the process started. No matter how successful our troops or our AID representatives are in winning the support of the people, in the end, that job can only be done by the Vietnamese themselves. As good friends and allies, we can help strengthen the ties of the people to their government. But only that. We can only help. The Vietnamese know this, and they're doing something about it. As a matter of fact, what they're doing constitutes the heart and soul of their effort toward building a nation. This is a training center at Vung Tau, a very special training center. It's for the training of what the Vietnamese call revolutionary development cadre. The men who come here, 5,000 of them at a time, 20,000 a year, literally hold the hopes for Vietnam's social revolution in their hands. They come here to assimilate the principles of their government's plan to revitalize the country and learn the skills and techniques with which to translate those principles into effective action. You may not believe it to look at me, but I'm Captain Jean Savaggio, United States Army. This is the uniform here at Yung Tao. I'm an advisor here, but only that. You see, the Vietnamese are running the show. And it's an arduous one. About half the total training is taken up with military subjects. The job of these men will be to move into areas which American or Arvin troops have cleared, but subsequently passed on through. And their first responsibility will be to take up where the military had to leave off in providing security for the area. They are the sons of farmers and fishermen and have lived all their lives close to the soil. They don't need much instruction in how to harvest a rice crop or bring in a catch. But techniques for improving the crop and the catch are important parts of the curriculum. Someday, a village's loyalty might turn on just such instruction. They become well-schooled in the causes and progress of the war, probably as much as any national spokesman. And one fact is drilled into them constantly the necessity of reaching the hearts and minds of the people among whom they will be working. When their training is completed at the end of 13 weeks, they are formed into cadre groups to take their revolution, the social revolution, to the countryside. The program 
time in which these cadre groups are involved actually begins well before they move into a village. First of all, regular forces, either ours or South Vietnamese, sweep through the area to clear it, destroy, capture, or chase out any Viet Cong or main force enemy units. Then regional forces, companies of troops employed within a province, and popular forces, platoons and squads within a district, secure the area with their patrols and small-sized operations. Then the cadre groups move in, dressed in the black pajamas of the peasant, trained to look at the world as the peasant sees it, but also as the soldier must. This black pajama uniform is very important. Because it is the traditional garb of the peasant, it's easier for the peasant to identify himself with the cadre groups. It complicates our problems of identification, of course, for the Viet Cong wear the same uniform. The cadres work with the people to gain their trust. This is made considerably easier by their being assigned to the districts they grew up in, among the people who know them. They're not left entirely on their own, military units on the periphery, help to deter the enemy from coming back. But these men still carry a heavy share of the responsibility for village security. Within this screen of security, the cadre teams begin rooting out the VC infrastructure, if one exists. At the same time, the spade work of the social revolution begins, with a full explanation to the people of just what the cadres are in the village for and what they hope to accomplish. This is not always an easy step. The overwhelming majority of the people of South Vietnam are dead opposed to everything that the enemy stands for, but their experience has made them wary. Too often they've watched the VC murder anyone who has cooperated with the government. They have to be persuaded that this won't happen again. It's the job of the cadres to do that persuading, and also to persuade the villagers that their welfare is actually of deep concern to their emerging nation. One team starts out right away to find out what the people's particular problems are, what is needed the most to improve life in the village. Once the problems have been determined, another team starts organizing the effort to solve them. This is where the people's first commitment takes hold. But what the cadres must do now is encourage and lead the villagers into tackling the projects themselves. The team will find the necessary materials and supplies to be used, often from U.S. sources. But the people have to contribute their labors and energies. As their work progresses, the cadres encourage and supervise the election of community leaders. When a village gripped with fear or mired in apathy awakens to a sense of its own importance and feels the stirrings of faith in itself and in the far-off government which is demonstrating its compassion and concern, when the people of a community begin to take their destiny in their hands, that is the transformation of social revolution. And it is precisely this which the revolutionary development cadres are endeavoring to bring to the villages of Vietnam. They stay in the village for several months, sometimes a year. When their job is through, if they've done it well, they will leave behind them a community of people who now are able to believe in their future, who are determined to work for it, to share in the defense of it. One of the final missions of a cadre group is to train a self-defense force from among the able-bodied villagers, a force prepared to help meet any attack by the enemy. When this happens, the people's commitment is complete. Vietnam has a lot riding on these men. We all have. That's right. We all have. Vietnam will not look sad.
say with absolute certainty that Vietnam is going to succeed in building the nation at once during the hardships of, and trials of war. But powerful ideas generate their own growth, even in the most bitter of climate. One of these is the belief in individual man's dignity and his right to determine his own course. It is this idea which animates Vietnam's spirit today. It is an idea with which we Americans are familiar. It is to honor because history will not give them the luxury of the time that it once gave us. Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam will not look sang It is June 1967. The place is the South China Sea near the coast of Vietnam. The USS Harnett County has sailed 10,000 miles from the western shore of the United States and has arrived at the Cochin River in the Mekong Delta. The war that lies ahead for these men will be on the rivers and rice paddies of this ancient land. For the next 12 months, they will launch patrol boats and armed helicopters against the enemy. They will search from the skies and patrol a thousand miles of waterways to fight the Viet Cong. This is their story. It begins here on the land amid the lace-like structure of canal and waterway. This is the heartland of South Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. Here, where the mangrove forests stretch as far as the eye can see, where lush farms and rice paddies dot the land, the Viet Cong exercise a shadow tyranny over the people, using the age-old tactics of force and terror. These men and others like them have come here to aid this small nation caught in the midst of war. And in an age that boasts of science and technology, what they accomplish here will still depend on the courage and skill of each of them. The ship is two miles from the mouth of the Cochin River, two miles from the place her real work begins. Navigation here is dangerous. There is a possibility of running aground on the treacherous shoals and sandbars created by the mud and silt of the river. Added to this danger is the fact that the Viet Cong are entrenched in this area and up until now have roamed the waters almost at will. For the 278 men that comprise this ship, this is the last leg of a long journey. It is a lonely time. San Francisco and Seattle are far behind. The sights and sounds of a once familiar world have given way to the ominous quiet of the nearby jungle shore. The 
first patrols leave the ship at dawn, and the men fall into the routine that will govern their lives in the months to come. Words like patrol and reconnaissance, words that were once part of their training, here on the river become part of their lives. Far below the unfamiliar stretches from horizon to horizon, beneath them lies another world, one of uncertainty and danger. The job has begun. Report. A war does not depend on ceremony, yet even in this place, a few short guards from Viet Cong territory, there is time for morning quarters. Here on the ship, you get up to Reveille and stand in line to get your food. You live and work with other men in the crowded space of an iron hull, and you adjust to the formalities of shipboard life. But for many, the formalities end when their work begins. Foreman. Their job is on the river, and for the next 16 hours, their home will be a small, armed, fiberglass boat, which will carry them far from the safety and comforts of the ship. Their mission is to search, to patrol the waterways and canals of the Delta, to keep the enemy off the river. Delta, the river is the key to the land. To the Vietnamese who live here and use it every day, it is the heart of their existence. It nourishes their crops, provides a route to the marketplace, and sustains their families. These waters are the highways of commerce, and there are over 5,000 miles of natural and man-made canals that wander past cities, villages, and hamlets. But if these waters provide a way of life for the people, they also provide a means of transportation to their enemy. The Viet Cong use the rivers to carry arms, ammunition, and supplies, and to extort taxes from the people. The Viet Cong have used innocent-looking sampans, and even children, to lure the patrol boats into ambush. And the men have learned from bitter experience that they cannot relax for a moment. A hidden hand grenade, a concealed rifle, these are the hallmark of the enemy and the stamp of guerrilla warfare. Until boats are thoroughly searched, everyone must be suspect. You cannot always tell a Viet Cong by looking or even talking to him. They wear no uniforms, only the black clothes of the peasants. So all boats on the river must be stopped and searched. It's a tedious and dangerous job. 200, 300 sampans are checked every day. You talk with the people, listen to their gossip, and try to get information that may lead to the enemy. It's like a puzzle. A man with an identity card from a too distant province. Or a woman with too large a load of rice for just her family. You may not speak their language very well, but you see things, find clues, and try to put them together.
can tell time by counting the hours since you left the ship. 16, 18 hours a day. Far from home and far from the sea, you cover endless miles of water accompanied only by the constant drone of diesel engines. of call, the men labor at the task of keeping a ship fit and our weapons ready. Technology has provided the tools and the training, but men provide the work. Equipment must be cared for and maintained. Each hour of patrol means additional hours of tedious, back-breaking work. There is no room for error. In the days that follow, the lives of others will depend on the performance and patience of these men. free time by playing cards, answering a long overdue letter, or reading an outdated magazine. But the vigil continues. A modern naval vessel is more than guns and bullets, steel and black oil. The men aboard her have been trained to perform all the services of a small town. The Navy corpsman is the doctor here, and drugs and medicine are the tools of his profession. But to a people like the Vietnamese, a people who live in the shadow of poverty and disease, medicine and men like the corpsman offer hope for a better life. like this one. A community of 2,000 who work the land, raise livestock, and ply their local trades. But their otherwise simple lives are complicated by disease and infection. The corpsman has set up a clinic in the playground of the local school where patients have already gathered. Use the soap and rainwater. Yeah. And you have him spread this on the areas that are itchy. Yeah. So that he'll, uh, uh, how, uh, how, how many times? How about twice a day? Hey, 
There are no monuments to what is accomplished here. There is no glory. But in this war, the work done here has become as important as any battle. to the Mekong Delta. Monsoons begin in the east, move westward, and cloak the land in torrential rains. Soaking everything, wearing away at the nerves. Pumps clogged, motors fail, ammunition corrodes and guns rust. For days there is no pause, only the constant sound of rain against metal. But the work of war goes on. The enemy has used the rains to his advantage. Two companies of Viet Cong have been discovered on the shores of the Ba Lai Canal, digging bunkers for an ambush. A plan is made. Patrol boats will transit the canal and act as decoys to force an encounter with the enemy. The ship's helicopters will remain on board, fueled and armed, ready for action. Charlie will expend a little more energy than he has been. So I want you people to be extremely cautious on the rivers. The risks of entering a narrow canal are great. These shallow zones of water are the haven of the Viet Cong. are forced to move slowly, becoming easy targets for enemy fire. Unforeseen circumstances often dictate strategy. Despite all their preparation and planning, the men must turn back. The water has become too shallow. They are forced to find another route.
This is Iron Hat 2. Roger out. Bridge, this is Radio. Scramble the Heroes. Okay, Bill. Check the fuel boost pump. Are we clear? Coming hot. yet been won. There is no rest now for these men. The enemy has shown himself. They must act quickly, decisively, to deny him his sanctuary. New targets out of reach of the PBRs have been located by the Vietnamese command center. Enemy gun emplacements, bunkers, and supply sampans. Eight, zero, one. I see what's happening.
In this engagement, one of the helicopters was shot down by a sniper in a sampan. This is the price a few will pay in any war, the cost of involvement. And for the remainder of their tour in Vietnam, these men will pay this price time and again. They have faced the enemy. They have endured the ordeal of battle. They have won their badge of courage. A wounded man comes in on a stretcher. Another call to battle. Tracers cutting the stillness of a twilight sky, stabbing at the fleeting shadow of a faceless enemy. The smoke and flame of burning cordite, and the darkness of men at war. The fight will go. 